we're discussing choropleths. We're going to dis talk about what they are, what types of choropleths exist, and also how you can make uh, excellent choropleths. What are the key dimensions and areas where you have to think a little bit about to design and craft the perfect choropleth for what you want to do, for what you want to communicate, and for the data that you have. So let's jump on the slides and have a closer look at choropleths. Choropleths are thematic maps in which the values of a variable are encoded using a color gradient of some sort. So in a way, what they're doing, what they are is maps that bridge cartographic traditional display of geographic information with statistical, not necessarily explicitly spatial information. And what we're doing, or the way we're doing this, is by encoding the non-spatial information in color and then assigning that color into locations based on the uh, location of the entities that each value represents. Okay, now of course the, um, the, the devil's always in the details and there's a lot of implicit or explicit assumptions we need to make to, to produce a core of breath. So this clip is really about getting you to think about which are those decisions and how can you uh, be explicit, intentional and um, creative about making right decisions. Before we get into that, choropleths are a display of information in a discrete way. In other words, the first thing we do to make a choropleth is partition the geography or delineate areas in the geography to which we're going to assign a particular value. So every area will get a color, but the color is is specific for that area and is not going to spill over into the color of the area next to each other, for example. This is something that when we that when we discuss points, for example, we'll we'll see. But it, for choropleths, this is a discrete um, representation of data. And in that sense, you can think of them almost as this the spatial, the geographic counterpart of a histogram. A histogram is a, a visual device that allows us to gauge the distribution of a of a set of values by splitting the, the value set, the value range, into a discrete and mutually exclusive um, sections. So the idea of histograms and uh, choropleths is, is not too far off um, in this context. As we've said, va values are classified, well actually we haven't said these, values are classified into specific colors, which is to say that you start with a potentially very large number of uh, values. You imagine you're mapping, as we'll do in a few slides, say 300 neighborhoods in, in Liverpool, and you only want to use seven colors. There's a lot of reasons, we'll talk about that later why, but there's a lot of really good reasons to use a smaller number of colors. There's a key decision to be made and a key choice to decide how you assign a given value into a specific color. Okay, so what we're doing effectively is, is setting up a classification problem. We have an entire set of values and we have to classify each of them into a smaller number of colors. To do that, we create bins, what we call bins or or boxes or buckets or containers, right? We say from the smallest value to this value, this bucket, every value in within these two uh, bounds, whoops, um, it's going to get this color. And then from this value to this other value, you're going to get another color. Implicitly, what we're saying this, you might have picked up this already, is that there is an information loss. Every time that we translate 300 numbers into seven colors, we're going to miss granularity. We're going to miss detail, right? And that's something that we have to, to live with. Now, there's a good reason why you would want to do that. And this is because it's at the end of the day, there's a trade-off with simplicity. Just because you can display 300 colors on the screen doesn't mean that the brain is able to process them and that is able to tell subtle differences between color 200 
and color 201. In fact, there's a lot of research that says that pretty much after 12 colors, uh, we cannot, our brain cannot tell differences of nuance. So this is really why, if we know that the brain is not going to be able to process that those nuances, we simplify the map by getting the getting rid of those nuances and sim and creating a much um, more streamlined map. Seven colors, not three hundred. But it's important to recognize that this involves a process of information loss. So what are the classification choices? The, remember that we've framed this idea of creating a choropleth as a classification problem. How do we go from the value of its neighborhood? Imagine we're looking at population, population density, um, income, etc. How do we go from the value of each of the 300 polygons that we want to map into the color that we are going to assign to that area? Well, it turns out that there are three particular or three key choices to be made. One is the number of bins. So how many colors do we want? Do we want five? Do we want 10? Do we want 100? The second one is once we know the number of buckets is how do we define the size and the range of those buckets? How do we decide where do we draw the line between getting the darkest color and the second darkest color, right? Which value, how do we decide if this value is getting the lightest shade or the second lightest? So that's choice number two. And then the final one is, once we know how every value is converted into a bucket, which color actually are we gonna assign to that bucket? And there's a lot of, um, well, th there's a bit of clever, thinking that we can do around that as well. So let's look at each of them in a bit more detail. The first question, how many bins? This is, we've already said that this, this is a trade-off. We're trading off detail granularity for cognitive load. Cognitive load, load is, a, is a fancy term to describe what I, what I said a couple of slides ago. The fact that the, the human brain cannot process too much nuance and too much detail. That even if the screen is displaying 300 different gradients of a color, the human brain is only going to be able to pick up about 12 max, right? So when we're finding out how many, when we're trying to decide how many colors we want to use, it's useful to remember that this is a trade-off, that we're trading detail for simplicity, for the ability of understanding. Now, of course, this is a is a bit of a continuum, right? And the exact number really depends on what your map is about. So if what you if you're really focused on getting a simple message across, that usually suggests you will probably do fine with less colors. However, taken to the extreme, that implies a single color, and that usually means that you're not communicating any detail at all. In fact, that is not properly a choropleth, right? In other, on the other end of the, on the, of the continuum, you may think that the more colors, the better, but then you have to remember that every additional color you're adding, you are burdening the user of that map with a bit more cognitive load. You're putting a bit more weight on their shoulders to understand and process the information that is being that's being displayed. So the reason again there isn't a one one size fits all rule and it, it, it boils down to what you're trying to, to communicate with your map. However, a good rule of thumb that is based on a lot of uh, research and information perception and, and cognitive perception says that beyond 12 distinct colors the brain cannot process more nuance and more detail. So if you're thinking of getting a gradient from light blue to dark blue, keep in mind that beyond 12 shades, the, the, even if you put it out on the map, the brain, the human brain will not be able to process that difference. The second one is how do we bin? So we already know how many we how many buckets, how many groups, and how many colors we'll get. Now, how do we decide which color gets every single value? 
And this is essentially a statistical problem when you when you think about it. So there's different um, types of approaches, and these approaches depend also on the type of data that you have. The first example we have is what's called unique values. This is specifically designed for categorical data. Remember that categorical data are data which don't encode any type of gradient or ordinal nature. In other words, one value is not more or less than the other. And even more, there isn't a, a quantity element of, of what the, the, value, the values encode. So for example, um, ethnicity or religion or country of origin, these are all examples of categorical data, cases where one value is not more or less than, than the other. And there isn't an ordinal nature and an ordinal characteristic in, in the data set. For these cases, if this is the data that you want to map, there isn't a gradient that will, that will make the choropleth. What you want to do is find out, and we'll talk about more um, the specific color schemes that we can use, but what you want to, to convey with the color choice that you do is that uh, you don't that they are different, they're qualitatively different entities. And uh, we've already talked about a couple of examples. So here is an illustration. Here is a map of, of every neighborhood in Liverpool where you can see, you, you probably can't count, but there's about 300 polygons, 300 small areas. And every area is colored by whether the population who lives there, it's there's a majority that are single or that are married. So if in a given neighborhood, the, the majority of the population is married, the polygon gets a green. If the majority of the population is single, the polygon gets a yellow. Again, yellow and green don't involve any ordinal or quantitative uh, connotations. So what we're encoding with this is a different color for every category. And those colors, as we'll talk later, don't necessarily have to Oh, well, they, they should not, sorry, uh, they should not Im, Im, imply any gradient. We're now moving into a case where we have continuous data. So by continuous data, what I mean is data that are first ordered. So if you have values, you can clearly tell an order of which one is above or below another one and also where that order implicitly or that order also involves uh, quantitative differences or for ex for example if you have two values and one is double or is twice as much uh, the other one then the first value is double and we can assume that the quantity measure is double than the than the second one a good example of this is population. Let's think of the map that we've seen of Liverpool and for every neighborhood, we're going to measure how many people live in that neighborhood. So if one neighborhood has 10 people and the other one has 50 people, then we can say that the second one has five times more. This implicitly is saying that there is an order by which higher values involve more population, but also that that order has a proportion, right? If that is the case, if we're using this kind of continuous data, we can use this approach of equal interval. And the way we're going to decide how a single value gets a given color is by taking the value span of the data and splitting it equally. So going back to the example of population, imagine that in Liverpool, neighborhoods go from zero people, where it's an empty neighborhood, to the largest neighborhood, which has, let's say, 500 people. In the equal interval case, we're creating the buckets, we're assigning a color to each value based on an equal split of the values, which is to say, we take, imagine a line that goes from zero to 500. And if we want, say, five groups, we're taking uh, equal splits. Okay, along the values. In other words, the splitting happens based on the numerical value. This approach can give way to more outliers. 
So if we have a few values that are very high in the case of population, if we have some areas that have a lot of population, then this algorithm is going to give a lot of weight and it's going to sort of bring to life in the map, as we'll see in the example in a second, those cases. But at the same time, it's also going to basically bunch almost everyone else into the same color. Let's see why. So here we have uh, the distribution of uh, a measure called uh, deprivation, which is a, a holistic measure of um, harshness and, and poverty in a given area. And what we find is that the distribution is what a statistician would call highly skewed. Most of, the, most of our values, most of our uh, neighborhoods fall into a high rank of deprivation. So in this data, actually, zero would be the most deprived neighborhood. And there's a few neighborhoods that have a very high rank, or in other words, have a low level of deprivation. If this is what our continuous data set looks like, the equal interval algorithm is going to work in the same in the following way. It's going to take the first, the lowest value, in this case zero, the highest value, in this case somewhere around 30,000, and it's going to split that range from zero to 30,000 equally, irrespective of how many neighborhoods in this case are going to fall into each bucket or each uh, range in, into each group. Yeah. What is What does that mean in terms of the map? Well, it, it means that most of the neighborhoods are going to get in this case, we can see two colors, the darkest and the second darkest color. And if you look at the map, most neighborhoods, most areas, most polygons are colored with the darkest or the second darkest color. Yeah. Now, there's a few what we would call outliers on this part of the distribution. And these are going to be almost brought to the fore of the map. So just a few, ma a few areas are going to get the lightest or the second lightest um, color. In some cases, this is absolutely fine. In fact, in some cases, we want our map to highlight uh, outliers and almost bring to uh, take to the background the rest of the observations, the rest of the areas. But this might not be exactly what we want. So if this is uh, an undesired consequence, then equal interval will not necessarily work with this type of data or data that are, that are distributed in this way. In those cases, another approach that we can take is the idea is the quantile algorithm in which we ignore the values and all we do is look at the rank and create groups or buckets that have the same proportion, the same amount of um, observations. In this case, the splitting is based on the rank of the value, not the value. The value is irrespective, is, is irrelevant in this context. Well, it is not irrelevant, it's useful and it's necessary because we need it to rank every observation. So we need to know the value, of course, to know which is the most, the neighborhood with the most population and the second most, uh, the second neighborhood with most population all the way to the neighborhood with the least population. But once we've established that order and that rank, the values are actually relevant because what we're doing is splitting the distribution and splitting our neighborhoods in, or our areas in groups that have the same amount of uh, observations. And in cases where the distribution is skewed, like the example before, this is going to give us a map that gives the same weight to each kind of value, to each type of value, which is not bunching um, more common values in the same color. Let's see the example. This is the same data set as before and with the same distribution as before. And what we have now is that the quantile algorithm has split based on the number, based on groups that have the same number of uh, polygons. And what we have is that in terms of value ranges, the, the first, the lowest color, the first category or the first group has a very small value range because it has 
that's a part of the distribution that has a lot of observations cramped into that area. While at the other end of the distribution, the, the, the final group, the group with the highest values of, of IMD rank, has a much broader range, right? And that is because in this part of the distribution, you have to, you have to take a much broader range of values to take the same amount of polygons. How does this translate geographically? Well, we have a map where there's the same amount of polygons with each color. So we don't have anymore a map dominated by dark purple as before. And in some cases, this might be something that we, we desire and that is, is, is a good thing. However, keep in mind that this is not ideal also, or it's not always ideal. What is the drawback of this approach is that in these cases, for the algorithm to fulfill its, its role of assigning groups with the same amount of polygons or with the same amount of entities or observations, this is the issue. We have to give the same color to observations that have potentially very different ranges or very different values. So to give you to give the to look at the example here, the lightest purple or or the, or the um the lightest pastel color here gets polygons that that go from below 20,000 all the way to 30,000. This is a huge range and we're giving the same color to all of those observations in the map. And the power of maps is that once you make two polygons with the same color, our brain, remember our processing power based on color, is going to immediately think that those two polygons are, are at least similar. May, might, they might not be the same, but we're going to think that they're at least similar. And we're going to ignore, remember that in most cases we're only going to get this side of the uh, analysis. We might only present the map. And we're going to ignore or just not even know that this color is grabbing areas that are potentially very different. So again, this is something is not right or wrong. It's something we just need to keep in mind when we're making the analysis, but also when we're analyzing choroplets. And just as we've seen the equal interval or the uh, quantile algorithm, there is a lot of different algorithms in the literature that try to optimize for different types of splitting, that try to get different principles to, uh, to make that split, to make this classification problem. And some of them are more intuitive, some of them are way more sophisticated. For example, uh, the Fisher-Jenks algorithms, the natural breaks algorithms, they involve fairly sophisticated statistics to make this mapping between a given value in the distribution of your data set and a particular color. Okay. So now that we've seen how we can make this mapping, the final, remember there were three, uh, three principles. The final principle is which colors we actually assign. Now that we know how many colors we're going to use, now that we know how we are assigning a given color to a given value in our data set, the final choice is which color scheme or color palette we're going to use. And in this case, the, um, the trick is to align the choice of colors that we make, not only with the aesthetic properties, but with the purpose and with the type of data that we have. And here is where we're coming back to uh, the discussion we started with unique value mapping and say if you have categories or you have categorical data, qualitative data, data that is not ordered or orderable, pick a categorical palette or pick, in other words, colors where there isn't an implicit hierarchy or order. This is an example. Uh, where yellow is not more or less than uh, red or is not more or less than turquoise or not more or less than dark blue or gray, right? In these cases, we're encoding in the choice of color the idea that our data set is categorical. And this is really what you want to do when you're picking a color palette first. <laughs>
The second one is uh, the second type of palette is what we're going to call graduated or sequential. You might also see it as sequential. Here is the example where we have continuous data as we've seen in, in the previous slides, where one value is we can tell whether it's more or less, and actually we can also tell whether it's much more or uh, much less than another value. And in this case, again, we want to encode this bit of information about our data in the choice of color. For example, here, we, where we go from light pastel all the way to dark um, purple. Implicitly, our pattern processing engine in our brain, when it sees this color palette, thinks, if I see dark purple, I know this is a, a, a higher or lower, uh, well, in this case, a higher value than this less dark or lighter purple. And there's an implicit hierarchy and an implicit um, set of proportions that it's encoded in this type of um, palette. The final one that we're going to see is also graduated, is also for continuous data, but it's what we're going to call a divergent palette. And this is really a combination of two palettes starting from the center splitting out into um, different directions. So we're going to use these palettes not only when we have continuous data, but where we have continuous data where there is an origin or what we will call an anchor point that starts not on one end of the distribution, but it starts in the middle or somewhere in the center. A good example of these, for example, uh, a good example of these are temperatures. Usually you want to anchor the mapping of temperature, for example, to zero degrees, to freezing, and use one sequential palette for above freezing and another one for below freezing. You might be using reds for above freezing and getting hotter and hotter, and then blues, for example, a cold color for uh, below freezing. Another example of where it's a good choice to use a divergent palette is where you're mapping standardized data. Standardized data are those where zero represents the average, and then above zero is above the average, below zero is below the average. It's a good uh, opportunity to use two divergent palettes and give the lightest color to the middle, and then two different colors that progressively get darker as the values are further apart from the zero. And at this point, another uh, a really good trick that is also referenced in the website is this Color Brewer website, which is based on a lot of uh, research uh, led by Professor Cynthia Brewer on color perception and on choice of color palettes for coral plates. So this is a good segue into the final slide of this clip where we talk about tips for making good coral plates. And the first one is always... Think of the purpose of the map. What do you want to communicate? What is the data that you have? What is the information and the message that you want to get across? And how can you make every choice that we've seen that you have to make, whether implicitly or explicitly, whether you realize or not, how can you make those choices intentionally to optimize for the purpose that you want to give this, this map? Another really useful tip that I found um, in my experience is trying different classification algor algorithms or different classification alternatives, because this is a form of exploratory analysis. If you know what the, how the algorithm, how the method works, and you try different choices in a single data set, the, different, the differences that result in the final, in the outcome maps are hints and uh, tips for you to understand better how your data is distributed. Not only how it's distributed geographically, but also how it's distributed statistically. And more importantly, how statistics and geography combine to create the map that you visualize. So to really learn about, learn about your data before you present it finally, try always different alternatives. And as we've as we've done in the previous slides, try to combine geovisualization approaches like choroplets with other statistical devices like histograms or density plots like we've done. Because it, you need to think that what you're trying to do in this context is uh, 
exploring data and that data has a geographical side it has a geographical and a spatial aspect but it also has a, a statistical aspect there is properties that are implicitly statistical and what you want to do is learn and look at your data from as many perspectives and point of view, points of view as possible to learn everything there is every every sort of hidden corner of your data set